I'm Margaret Amy, and I'm here to bring you the Bible reading tonight, and it's in two parts. Genesis 2, verses 18 to 25, which is on page 4 of the Blue Bibles in front of you. Then 1 Corinthians 6, from verse 12 to verse 4 of the following chapter. You can find that on page 1148. Page 4 to start with, then 1148. I have the right to do anything you say. Sorry. Genesis 2, 18 to 25. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. That's over to page 1148 in 1 Corinthians. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. Now for the matters you wrote about. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Thanks so much, Margaret. Good evening. Well, uh, over these weeks, we're looking at different 
hot topics in our evening services, and, uh, and there aren't many hotter than the subject of sex. And the first thing I want to say is that God is for sex. He, he designed people to have sex, and uh, sex is something to be celebrated. Maybe not what you expected when you come to a church service. But look at Genesis chapter 2. Go back there in page 5 and verse 23. And then it says, Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, then the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of a man. This is poetry, the first human poetry in the Bible. And Adam is excited. It's, it's a song. And it's easy for Christian teaching on sex to sound the exact opposite as it plods through bullet points on the purposes of sex. But God's word is saying here, there's meant to be excitement and attraction and romance and sexual desire. And the Bible book, the Song of Solomon, celebrates that. It's also a poem about going out and marriage. And here are some lines from the guy in it as he romances his girl. Your hair is like a flock of goats, Leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like the, a flock of shorn ewes that have come up from the washing. Now, maybe these chat up lines wouldn't have the same impact in the 21st century. So I caution you not to use them, especially lads. But you can see the passion and the attraction and the romance in his words. So, God is for sex. But we need to ask the question, what is sex for? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that passage we read, Paul is writing to this young church in Corinth, and he's writing about sex, and he quotes three perspectives that were very popular views of sexuality that were held in Corinth. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 page 1,148. The first one I've called is that sex is to make me happy. Look at chapter 6, verse 12. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be answered, uh, um, mastered by anything. Paul is quoting people in Corinth who say, I, I have the right to do anything. I mean, sex is not illegal. But Paul says, well, just because we, we can't do something, it doesn't mean it's the best. And this view of, of sex sees sex as a critical way of self-expression, a way of being true to myself, of finding who I am that all sex is right if it's safe, says this view. And in this position, this uh, opinion, the, the quality of interpersonal love is the primary benchmark that makes sex right or wrong. And the second view is in chapter 6, verse 13, where Paul quotes them say, you say food for the stomach and stomach, stomach for the food and God will destroy them both. And the attitude could be phrased, uh, paraphrased as sex is just an appetite. When you need food, you eat. When you need sex, you have sex. And this little addition, but God will destroy them both, is from the view that the material world is temporary and really not all that important. And therefore, this view says, if you need to have sex, do it. Because what is important is not what you do with your body, but what you do with your soul. And the other view that Paul deal with, deals with is in chapter 7 and verse 1, where he quotes them when they say, It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Now this is the almost opposite view of the two that we've been thinking about so far. 
And this could be summarized with sex is dirty. Sex is defiling. And whilst it's kind of necessary in order to have babies, a holy person really shouldn't do it. And these three views, though expressed 2,000 years ago, are pretty widespread today as well. But are they healthy? And are they fulfilling views? Well, there's an interesting study that came out uh, in May this year from the BBC saying that people are having less sex now than in previous years. That there's something that is not satisfying people in the way that they have sex. And yet, the research also showed that people want to have more sex. Also, sadly, divorce rates are still almost at 50% in our country. And we also have a loneliness epidemic where people feel isolated. Sex is not living up to its billing. But the Bible has a better way. God offers the world a revolutionary view of sex. And it also gives the world a revolutionary view of singleness and marriage as well. In chapter 6, uh, verse 16, Paul says that when a person has sex with someone, they become one flesh. He says, do you not know that, when, that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? Don't get distracted by that prostitute reference. Because in that culture, everybody was married. And if you were single, you were a prostitute. But the principle still applies. As he talks about sexual immorality in this passage twice, uh, once in verse, the end of verse 13, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And then verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. And the word he uses there is the word porneia, from which we, it's the Greek word porneia, from which we get the word pornography. And that means sex outside of marriage. He could use a different word if he was talking about adultery, sex with someone who is married, who you're not married to, but he uses the word porneia. So Paul talks about becoming one flesh with someone who you have sex with. But what does that mean, to, ha to become one flesh? Well, if you remember back to the good old days of, of English at school, we often find that important themes and key ideas are picked up in the first few chapters of a book. And it's like that with the Bible too. So it's in the first few chapters that God reveals what the de designer's intentions are how he intends men and women to relate to him and to each other. And so it sets a foundation for our thinking and understanding that's picked up throughout the whole of Scripture. And so flick back to Genesis chapter 2. And we'll look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, because that is the key verse on sex in the whole Bible. Page 5. And it says... Maybe it's also on the screen. Yes, it's also on the screen. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. See the phrase there? One flesh. Now what does that mean? Well, some people think that, that one flesh means physical union, kind of physical insertion. But that can't be what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians. Else he's saying... If someone has physical union with someone else, then they have physical union with someone else. Doesn't really prove a point, does it? So when Paul says, don't you know that when you have sex with someone, you become one flesh, he's not talking primarily about physical union. One flesh means something far deeper. Paul is saying God did not create sex to be def uh, a defiling but necessary act in order to have children. And God did not make sex as a way of making yourself happy or enabling you to find yourself. 
God, uh, God designed sex to be a radical self-giving. Sex was meant for you to be able to offer yourself so deeply the results in, that is, it results in personal transformation and completion. Listen to what Mike Mason wrote in his book, uh, The Mystery of Marriage. To be naked with another person is a symbolic demonstration of perfect honesty, perfect trust, perfect giving and commitment. And if the heart is not naked along with the body, then the whole action becomes a lie. The giving of the body, but the withholding of the self. And God says you must never have physical oneness without whole life oneness. God meant that physical oneness to be an outworking of whole life oneness. God is saying you must not get physically naked and vulnerable with someone without becoming naked in your whole life with them. That you must become legally and socially and economically and emotionally in every way committed. That you must give up your independence. And if you do that, your whole body giving is done in a context of whole life commitment. If you do that, then, you're, then you'll experience deep soul nurture and deep personal transformation. And so God is for sex, and sex is for self-giving, so sex is for marriage. Because if we use sex before or outside of marriage, there's a complete disconnect between what we're saying with our bodies and what we're saying with our whole lives. So if you've gone out with someone, and uh, you will have strong desires to go further and further physically, but it's not good to say more with your body than what you really mean and what you can commit to. You don't want to be telling a lie with that. When I was a student uh, in Cardiff, I went out with a girl for two years uh, and we got engaged after one of those years. And we really cared about each other. It's a bit complicated uh, because I'm not married to her now, but her name was Rebecca. But I called her Becca, so I will never call my wife Becca, just to keep it simple in my mind. Um, But I do regret how far we went physically in that relationship. We didn't have sex, but we came very close to. And there are still negative consequences of that in my marriage to Rebecca now. Because sexual union is also given to strengthen the union of lives. It's a bonding agent of married love. But having sex itself doesn't create a marriage. But it does bond people in marriage, and that's why it's not for relationships that are not lifelong. Because you're taking something that, relationally speaking, is superglue, And you're using it as if it was blue tack. And in 1 Corinthians, Paul says that only sexual sin is done against your body. That all of the sins are done outside your body. And he must be talking about this glue bonding of sex. Because there are many sins that we can do against our body. like if you commit suicide or something like that. Having sex is so bonding is because you become so emotionally involved and therefore you can't step back to make a free and wise and good decision about whether you should keep going out with this person or ultimately whether you should marry them or not. And you don't want to misuse Sex, because it will cloud your judgment on the most life-affecting decision of all. And it's not just full sexual intercourse that bonds people. All the intimacies leading up to it, including nakedness and sharing a bed 
together are all profoundly bonding and all belong to the territory of marriage. And so they will hinder you in the business of trying to work out whether a relationship should lead to marriage or not. Now, I haven't mentioned what the Bible teaches about gay relationships and and the transgender community. And this is because I don't want to be tokenistic, and that's not the main purpose of this talk. But on the church website, you'll find a talk uh, given by me a few years ago called, Is God Anti-Gay? And you can go there to, to find out more. And in the near future, I talked to John Risbridge about this, that we will plan to, um, to talk more about loving people who are transgender and how do we do that well. But there are some helpful resources uh, available. The first one is the Living Out website, who uh, are people who are gay or have same-sex attraction, as they would uh, describe it. Then there's Ed Shaw's book on the bookstore called The Plausibility Problem, The Church and Same-Sex Attraction. And also the Evangelical Alliance has uh, written this very helpful introductory booklet on uh, a brief biblical and pastoral introduction to understanding transgender in a changing culture. And I asked the office to print 20 of these. Some of them are at the welcome desk, some are at the table by the lift, and you can take them for free. But for now, let me say a couple of things. That Jesus is very clear that Christians are called to to love our neighbors. And that means loving all people. That means loving both gay, trans, straight people, whether they are Christian or not. And so disdain or looking down on has no place in a Christian's attitude and lifestyle. Jesus was so gentle and honoring and loving of people. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus uses an illustration of someone who was marginalized by the community to unpack who our neighbor is. A man was mugged and left on the side of the road, and the religious leaders ignored him, perhaps because they knew they would be ceremonially unclean for the next 24 hours if they helped him, or because they were afraid that the people who attacked this man would also attack them. Whatever the reason, Jesus condemns them for not showing love and mercy and urges his followers to be like the Good Samaritan and to be generous and accepting and sacrificial. And it doesn't matter if our neighbor is a Hindu neighbor or an atheist neighbor or a gay neighbor or a a trans neighbor or a Muslim neighbor. We are supposed to love our neighbors. And sadly, often the church hasn't been loving towards the LGBTQI community. Do you love gay people? Do you know people who are trans? Do they know that you love them? When did you last sacrifice yourself or go the extra mile for someone who is attracted to someone of the same sex? or is unsure about their identity. And my second comment is responding to the question, are Christians intolerant? Because this is an accusation often made against Christians. And I think the answer is no, no, and yes. Because there are three types of tolerance. There's relational, legislative, and intellectual. And we should not be relationally intolerant. As I've just said, Jesus calls us to love and be generous to everyone. And then Christians should be legislatively tolerant. Because we believe truth will out, because all truth is God's truth, we should fight for the rights of people, uh, of of peaceful and law-abiding groups to meet in safety and freedom, whether they be Hindus or atheists or Muslims or gay or transgender or Buddhist or whoever. We should be pleased that gay people have more protection 
than they did 50 years ago. But we can be, and we should be allowed to be intellectually intolerant, as should every other belief. We all should have freedom to respectfully disagree with one another and live in harmony together because we are relationally and legislatively tolerant of one another. And if you are gay or trans here tonight and not a Christian, you're very welcome. And if a Christian friend doesn't agree with you about your views on sexuality, it doesn't mean you are being judged. Because disagreeing with people doesn't mean that you're judging them or not loving them. I disagree with some of my best friends, but I still love them. And they disagree with me, but they still love me. We must acknowledge, though, that sometimes Christians haven't been good at disagreeing well. So this leads me to my final point. Because there's something more important than sex. And we need to remember that our number one relationship is with God. We can go back to Genesis and to Genesis 1, which you can see on the screen. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Now, what does it mean to be made in God's image? Well, to consider that more fully is not what we have time for tonight. But uh, I would recommend Andrew Page's book, on the five habits of deeply contented people, which unpacks exactly that uh, question and is on the bookstore. But the key thing of being made in God's image is that we uniquely can relate to God. And so the key thing to remember is that's our number one relationship. Whether we're single, plus or minus a boyfriend or girlfriend, or whether we're married or divorced or widowed or whatever. I mean, have you ever wondered why marriage has such a high profile from the very start of the Bible? I mean, after all, Genesis 1 gives the grand design account of the world. And then in Genesis 2, zooms in on human relationships. And half of that chapter is about marriage. And it's because at the deepest level, that high profile of marriage is because marriage is the Bible's number one visual aid to help us understand the relationship that Jesus offers to us. So the New Testament quotes Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30 and 31, and says this, I'm paraphrasing, if you're trusting in Jesus, marriage is a picture of your relationship with him. And Jesus' commitment to us is that he will love us for better and for worse, for richer and for poorer, in sickness and in health, despite our ongoing sinfulness and failures. And he will do that forever. And how has he shown us that? Well, on the cross, he demonstrated that all I am, I give you. And that all I have, I share with you. Because on the cross, he anticipated every sin of ours, past and future. In this area of sex, and let's be honest, we're all sexual sinners, aren't we? And all the other ones as well, including looking at pornography or going too far physically or marital unfaithfulness. Whatever is on your conscience, as I've been speaking tonight, and Jesus paid for the forgiveness of all of those. So that the moment we put our faith in him, he gets our sin and he gets rid of it forever and we get his acceptance with his father. We share in his, his standing in his father's love forever. That's God's word of forgiveness, which we all need tonight for this area of our lives. 
So my friends, please don't think that anything you've done is unforgivable or that he can't help you start again with him from where you are now. And that means we need to look to God as our primary source of worth and satisfaction. I read of a single woman who wrote this, I don't think the marrieds in church have a clue what it's like to watch friend after friend get engaged and married and to wonder what's wrong with you. And this illustrates the way we do receive a good deal of our worth from from other human relationships and that's what God meant. But that single woman also reminds us that we need to find our sense of worth primarily in God's love for us and in his creation of us as the people that we are rather than the people we might wish we were, whether that is more attractive or or cleverer or whatever it is for you. And we also need to look to God as our primary source of purpose. Another single person once said, being married and having children provides a purpose and shape to life for others, whereas I feel I lack that completely. And marriage does, of of course, provide purpose, but it's not the ultimate purpose or goal in life. Go back to 1 Corinthians and chapter 7. Because here is where Paul gives a radical perspective on singleness as well as on marriage. In uh, verse 8, he says, Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried, as I do. Then verse 10. He said, To the married, I give this command, not I but the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband. So he's saying, if you're single, stay single. And if you're married, stay married. And by saying that, he is so countercultural because this is the first time in ancient times where singleness was being honored. Prior to Christianity, nearly all religions and cultures made family and childbearing a foundational cultural value. There was no honor without family honor. There was no lasting significance or legacy without heirs. There was no no social state. There was no pensions. By contrast, the early church did not put pressure on people to marry. Moreover, it actually supported widows so they did not have to marry. And should they be widowed, Christian women also enjoyed very substantial advantages. Listen to what Rodney Stark, who's done much research into the first century church, said. Pagan widows faced great social pressure to remarry. Caesar Augustus even had widows fined if they fail to remarry within two years. In contrast, among Christians, widowhood was highly regarded and remarriage was, if anything, mildly discouraged. The church stood ready to sustain poor widows, allowing them a choice as to whether or not to remarry. Back then, there was no future without the family, no security No significance, no self-worth. But Paul and Jesus said, being single is okay. We've done it. And we've lived life to the full. And James and the church in Acts gave instructions to care and provide for the widows so they didn't have to get remarried. Why did they believe that being um, single or being married were both viable ways of life? Well, it was because whether we are married or single, God has a bigger overriding purpose for us. Like growing in our knowledge of him and making him known to those around us 
and building his church into the family he wants it to be and influencing the world for good in Jesus' name. So I close with this. Make the most of the situation you are in now. Enjoy friends. Enjoy God. Enjoy the church family. And look forward to heaven where you will enjoy the eternal wedding banquet. But above all, let me finish by reminding us that if we're trusting in Jesus, then he is like a husband who has said, I will to us, loud and clear on the cross. Which means that as we struggle and fail in this area and lots of other areas as well, he's ready to forgive us whenever we need it. And he's committed not to give up on us. Not ever. Let's spend a moment in quiet and then I'll lead us in a prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the greatest friend we could ever have, the greatest lover. Thank you that you, you sent your Holy Spirit so that you would never leave us nor forsake us. Help us to live with our eyes fixed on you. And would you satisfy our souls? Amen.